The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Hey, this is Loudon Swain. Fred Metcalf. Tony Ramos. Ryan Shute. Mike Golick. Bubba J. Johnny Hendricks. The Matthew Modine. The one and only Chael Sonnen. And you are listening to the one and only Short Time Wrestling Podcast by the often imitated and never duplicated Jason Bryant. I'm three-time national wrestling writer and broadcaster year, Jason Bryant, and I'll bring you news, reviews, previews, and interviews with the most notable names and personalities in wrestling. Subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcasting app by logging on to matttalkonline.com slash listen and leave a review for the show at matttalkonline.com slash get short time. Short time is sponsored by Flips Wrestling. Share your attitude and be heard at flipswrestling.com. Now it's time, because you've always got time for short time. For short time. Episode 180 of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast coming your way today. We're going to be talking a little bit of the Division Three wrestling scene with the recent announcement that Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, was ending its wrestling program. Today on the show, we'll talk with the past two head coaches of Knox College. They're the Prairie Fire in case you're wondering, with Joe Norton, currently the head coach at North Central College. He was there two years ago. And Matt Lowers, the recently departed head coach. Both of those guys left after one year. So we'll talk to them later in the program. But before we get to it, I want to say thank you to those of you who listen religiously, those of you who are new. I just want to say thank you because this show, while we do a bunch of different things here, we talk all levels of wrestling, and that'll go right into our first iTunes review. Again, you can leave your rating or review in iTunes for this show at matttalkonline.com slash get short time. That's all one word. Careful on your R's and T's because I've mistyped that. So matttalkonline slash get short time. First one from Dion underscore 127. Thank you for the five star rating and review. And uh, he mentions that uh, the fact that we don't limit ourselves to Division One covering all colleges of wrestling like the NAIA. So uh, I appreciate that comment. And of course, Sonny Boy Kyle, our first review that I know of from the state of Hawaii. Thank you, guys. And uh, if you want to get a shout-out on the show and you enjoy this program, go to matttalkonline.com slash get short time. It'll pop up your iTunes, and you'll be able to leave a rating or review. Of course, the other initiatives we've been pushing, the Hall of Fame Legends Series, which I'm looking for you, the wrestling community, to lend a hand on and help me crowdfund this project. For the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, I will be releasing a series of shows that interview the sports greats, our distinguished members of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, our legends, young, old, uh, recent, legendary, and uh, that is actually a, a donation. I will basically, all these these crowdfunding campaign, this will be for me to donate these products back to the National Wrestling Hall of Fame for their digital outreach program. You can find out information on how to contribute either by going to halloffamelegends.org or to matttalkonline.com slash contribute. You can do that with a one-time donation, or you can make small monthly donations via Patreon, and both of those are secure. And uh, if you hit certain levels with Patreon, that's at the small monthly level. So, uh, you know, basically to get this thing done, say we've got a 1,000 wrestling fans, and you're, you're, you're taking a dollar a month each. That's $12 a year. That's going right to this project for the Hall of Fame, and it'll also help... Uh, cover costs associated with that. So again, halloffamelegends.org to uh, complete your contribution to the show. I mean, obviously, uh, you don't have to set any giving level. Hey, if you like the show, I would just love you to have a rating or review. But if you want to get help me get that project funded, I would really, really, really appreciate it. Also, some news to report to you is that USA Wrestling has jumped back on the podcast train that's right. Bonus points. The USA Wrestling Podcast hosted by Richard Immel is now part of the Mad Talk Podcast Network. This show, uh, Richard's going to host it. He's kicked it off, too, with a great guest. He's got Jordan Burroughs on the first episode of Bonus Points. You can check that out at themat.com or go to matttalkonline.com slash bonus points. That'll take you right to the iTunes page to subscribe. So, I know Richard's been uh, wanting to do a show for a while. Uh, I had the USA Wrestling Matt Chat podcast while I worked there from 2010 to 2012. So you'll get all sorts of interesting uh, angles from Richard because he's right there in the office in that show on the com and part of the Matt Talk podcast network. So if you are a subscriber to the main Matt Talk feed where you get every single show, 
that this uh, organization puts out. That means the on the mat, the short time, the Buena Vista, the Old Dominion, Virginia Tech, the Maryland, uh, the, the, you know, the list goes on. You're going to get that in your feed automatically. So Richard launched his very first episode with the Mad Talk Podcast Network. Uh, you know, kind of, I was kind of pushing for this, just just pushing for it, just because I remember doing the show at USA Wrestling. It was a lot of fun. So check that out. Subscribe, rate and review, share, go crazy, because uh, Richard's got access to athletes that a lot of us don't. I mean, uh, he's right there. So bonus points. It's bonus points, y'all. Big topics in the news. Of course, you've probably heard it on uh, on other shows. I know that uh, Blood Round, uh, it's a fan-based podcast that's not safe for work by uh, two guys from Michigan, spoke very um, adamantly about the Tom Minkle retirement and the Roger Chandler hire on their program. That's at soundcloud.com slash bloodround. And, of course, Willie Saylor and uh, Christian Piles mentioned it at length on Flow Wrestling Radio Live. So, uh, And one thing, I want to get this out before. Why am I mentioning other shows? There's plenty of podcasts, people. You got different strokes for different folks. So I know that uh, I, I don't think I'm the only source of real wrestling news here. So uh, just remember that, that you can go around, you listen to any, anybody you want. I think the podcast medium has taken off. That's why I have eight and now nine shows uh, on the Mad Talk Podcast Network. We'll talk about another one shortly. But uh, again, they were uh, pretty outspoken uh, about the Minkle decision, and I haven't really chimed in on this yet. And this this is the situation where a lot of us in the wrestling community, and this is where uh, one of the few times, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, a little sarcasm there that I'll agree with uh, with Flo. I mean, it's it's just kind of funny. We joke about that now. But, you know, Tom Minkle, I want to say this right now, has always been a very friendly, respectable, first-class person to me. I, my interactions with him have been very limited over the years, but he has never done anything to me that would make me think that he's a bad person. And I don't think this is a, a discussion about being a bad person, but when you see what Michigan State's done the last several years and people wondering why, uh, you know, obviously those questions get called, uh, you know, to the forefront. And I think they're they're justifiably asked in a lot of cases. And, you know, Coach Minkle represented our country or had the opportunity to uh, be on the Olympic team, although we boycotted in 80, which you know kind of stinks. But he's been a, he's been a coach at the uh, Olympic level for a while. I mean, I, I, I don't have anything negative to say about Tom Minkle as a wrestler, as an Olympic level coach. But, you know, when when you look at it, look at it from and I hate to do this because wrestling is not basketball. It's not football. It's not. So we have to be a little bit more uh, keep, keeping things closer to the vest, so to speak. Uh, with with our sport, I mean, you know, I am guilty of this, uh, like everybody knows. When I get on some of these Twitter Twitter rampages, and uh, there be some Twitter beef, hashtag Twitter beef. That's for you, Zeb Miller. And you know, I'll argue with people in wrestling, and people will be like, "Oh, how's this good for the sport?" Yes, I can get that. But let, let's let's be honest. I mean, sometimes you need to be a little bit critical, and I think there's ways to go about it. Um, I've been kind of more. Um, using, say, the avoidance theory uh, publicly with certain things. But uh, I think some of those things were situations where I was working for the, the NWCA and I was working for USA Wrestling. So I couldn't really, really speak my mind. But uh, you got to – the question that's brought up, I think, most justly – I mean, you can say what you want about, about coaches' performance and then the performance of the team, especially in the last 10 years, and especially scoring – uh, negative half point. I mean, this this has been beaten to death by everybody that that follows Division One wrestling. But this is a state institution paid for by taxpayer money. So I, I thought it was pretty much required that you had to open a state job um, for you know a national, not necessarily a national search, but at least open a search. And and here's another thing, Roger Chandler. I cannot say a bad thing about him either because uh, we've we've known each other a while. We've uh, there's been times when he, him, me, him, and his, uh, his, the old assistant at Michigan State, Chris Williams, would be at the Ironman. We'd go out, have dinner, and, and talk wrestling. I mean, uh, you know, Rogers, you know, salt of the earth type of guy. So uh, it, this is not an, uh, you know, an indictment of Rogers a person either. But I do think that this this position should be open for a national search. I'm going to say the exact same thing about North Carolina, and uh, you know, while we don't know that that's happened yet, obviously. Uh, they haven't posted it. I mean, I think it's just a matter of time before they do. I think North Carolina's educational system has to do that, but we haven't heard anything about it. Coleman Scott is the interim head coach, and I think a lot of people believe that that's just pretty much uh, a formality that he's going to get the job. But, you know, you're talking power. you got two Power 5 schools here 
that uh, one hasn't isn't going to open it up for a national search. They're basically saying, okay, Roger Chandler is going to be the new head coach at Michigan State. All right. Yeah, is what it is. I, st- I still think a national search. I mean, and then if you decide Roger's the guy for the job, then hire him. I mean, it, you know, having a, a different look is not a bad thing. With North Carolina, that, that remains to be seen. So we're, we're waiting to see if that job does get publicly posted. Uh, you go NCA Market Watch, you have things like that. Uh, also, check out the story on Vice Sports. It's with a guy named Mike Malaconico, who does the Rhino Wrestling Club out in New Jersey, and this vice sports writer went through these things that Mike has called lock-ins, and this is a situation where it's unlike the journalism that we're used to, or at least our our dad's journalism, or even the journalism I cut my teeth in. Uh, I I wasn't really familiar with vice sports or vice uh, until actually it was the it was an article about uh, the CD, uh, obviously the Corey Mock situation, and they wrote about it uh, with the victim. I hadn't even been aware of that site really, and uh, you know I think it was Nick Veliket that told me that uh, that he liked uh, reading that stuff, and uh, I think T.R. Foley said something about it as well. And I, I read this, read the stories, I've read some other stuff on Vice, and it's it's pretty interesting, and it's more of a you know kind of a matter of fact type of speaking. I mean, you've got f bombs in there, you've got. You know, the, the, nobody's talking around quotes. They're not putting like if if I say I piss somebody off, they're not saying uh, you know ticked in parentheses to basically get rid of the word pissed. Uh, I did that one time in a paper. I quoted a high school athlete saying, "Yeah, it kind of pissed me off." And then when I went back in, in the paper, it said ticked in parentheses when the kid didn't say that. So you're not going to get any of that with Vice. So um, you know, it's not audio, so I can't say it's really uh, it's it's not a not safe for work thing. His podcast, A Wrestling Life, definitely not safe for work. It's actually. Uh, interesting to get his take, but uh, Mike Malaconico uh, had his uh, his lock ins kind of looked at by Vice Sports, and it's a real interesting read. So if you go over to Vice Sports and check that out, also um, a passing of note: former Virginia Tech athletic director Jim Weaver passed away on Thursday morning. Uh, he had retired in 2013 because of some health issues, and you know, say what you want about the whole Iowa Virginia Tech transfer situation, I'm not going to go that route. Uh, so some people will always kind of have a negative connotation when the name Jim Weaver is mentioned, uh, you know, coaches, athletes, entire fan bases. But Jim Weaver did a lot for Virginia Tech wrestling. He did a lot for Virginia Tech sports. And I say this because I'm I'm from Virginia originally. Most of you guys know that. If you don't, I'm from Virginia, a little town called Pocosin. But, uh, you know, I went to Old Dominion, and before Old Dominion had a football team, I was rooting for Virginia Tech football. That was basically my my college football team. I mean, Michael Vick was on my seventh grade basketball team when I still lived in Newport News. So, uh, you know, Tech and and the fact that I do a show called Inside Virginia Tech Wrestling here on the Matt Talk Podcast Network, because I will always have a tie to Virginia Tech. And people that didn't know Jim Weaver, and honestly, I never met the guy. I did talk to Whit Babcock, their, their current AD, but people that don't know Jim Weaver, um, in the wrestling community are, are always probably going to have a bad taste in their mouth about the situation with the transfers. Again, I'm not going to go into that because uh, this is a time for uh, thoughts and uh, condolences to send out to the Virginia Tech sports community, not just wrestling. So uh, basically that's all I've got to say there. Uh, Jim Weaver, former Tech athletic director, passed away on Thursday morning. Now on to our discussion where we will be talking Division three wrestling, as we will have the last two coaches from Knox College, which recently announced they were dropping their program. We'll have Joe Norton and Matt Lowers here on a short time. Guess what? AD did not want to be interviewed about this decision. So we had to do what we can. Let's talk to him now. And now our conversation as we talk Knox College wrestling. It's something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot and actually, unfortunately, won't be talked about a whole lot in the uh, the future as the school announced that it was not just dropping the rest. They just used the word ends wrestling. It says Knox College ends wrestling program. And today on the podcast, we'll have the past two head coaches at Knox College, Joe Norton, who's now currently the head coach at North Central College in the uh, suburbs of Chicago, and uh, Matt Lowers, the the outgoing head coach. And uh, before we get started, obviously, people are, are wondering, you know, there's been three coaches in three years. And Matt, you're the most recent guy to step down. And this wasn't just a situation. This this was more than just like you were unhappy or something. This was, you, you know, you had a situation that basically, you know, you love the sport so much, but uh, you, you had to step away. Yeah, unfortunately, I do. I've had uh, some problems in the past. I've had a couple of uh, cervical injuries and 
had a couple of surgeries and had another incident this uh, past fall where I uh, actually ended up uh, paralyzed for a, a short while. And uh, obviously feelings came back, but just with the surgeries and things that I've had, it's uh, still a real touchy kind of situation and really a danger to me. And I just had to make that decision, you know, what was going to be best for me long-term. I didn't feel like, you know, being the only coach there, not having an assistant, you know, and really you know, I need to jump in, work with guys when I need to work with them and drill and teach stuff. And I just, I didn't feel like it was in my best interest anymore health wise for the long run. So, uh, sadly stepped down. Well, what did you think about the school while you're there? For those that don't know, it's a, it's a 1400 students, uh, private college. It's in uh, Galesburg. Illinois. I guess that's what outside the quad cities, not, it's, you know, it's kind of in that vicinity. I'm not keen on the geography, because uh, I'll tell you why here in a minute, but uh, you know, what were your, your thoughts of the school the year, the year you were the head coach of the program? Well, I really enjoyed the people I was working with there. You know, I, I thought, you know, our department had some great people in it really felt like everybody really supported each other. Well, you know, so I was really fond of the people we were working with. I think there were some times where, you know, myself and some of the other staff maybe wondered if we had the full support um, from the academic side of campus but, you know, I think in most situations, I mean, you'll probably have that in athletic departments across the country. But um, definitely, I think there was a, a pro-athletic and an anti-athletic crowd. I think that's that's the way it is in education. I mean, if you look at any of these, any newspaper comment section, which kind of breaks any rule of the Internet, don't read the comments. But you'll see when they talk about multi-million dollar stadiums or billion dollar stadiums, you know, you'll see people pipe in and say, well, there should be no no college athletics. It should all be to education. So I think you're going to find that a lot of places. And now uh, let's switch gears to Joe here, who's again the head coach at North Central College. Joe, you were there at Knox College for one year. It was your first head coaching job. Then a situation arose. It was almost almost kind of too good to be true for you. Your alma mater, North Central, the, the coach there, Kevin Bratland, left to take the head coaching job at the Coast Guard Academy, which has not, that job hadn't been open since, let me think, probably the Nixon administration, a uh, longtime coach there. Steve Eldridge retired. Kevin Bratland goes to Coast Guard, leaving a opening at North Central. And after one year at Knox, you have an opportunity to go coach your alma mater. Yeah, and that's really what it was for me. Um you know, I'm sort of on the same page as Matt, where I really enjoyed Knox. Um, you know, wouldn't have expected the opportunity at North Central to come along when it did. Um, you know, but, you know, when that situation came about, it was something that I just couldn't pass up, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, and Joe, we actually ran into each other at the uh, the Detroit airport on the way to Division Three championships in Hershey with the... That's right. Yeah. You know, well, how about, you know, I mean, I'm getting off topic here for a moment, but it, that, that, that tunnel, the, the, the ripoff of O'Hare with their, their psychedelic Grateful Dead type of tunnel. That, 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 was, that was leaving your guys a little confused, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. We took a picture, and then we put it on our Twitter account of our uh, qualifiers walking through there. It was, uh, it was, I didn't think that was coming up. That was pretty cool. Now, as we, t- we circle back to Knox, here's the frustrating thing about this whole thing. And, and I just this is a rant I want to get out there, and I, I want to know this will kind of set up uh, where I'm going with this. Is I went to the, the Knox – athletic site which is prairie fire which in case you're wondering folks they're the prairie fire um okay i don't know what <laughs> you know maybe you guys can can touch on that later but uh the prairie you know they have one of the athletic sites they didn't even have one of these type of sites that you see that are common with athletic programs these days until about uh, a year or two ago i know that i received less than three press releases um, actually, I never received anything emailed to me, despite being on every SID list in the country, to my knowledge, and sending out all these releases. I never received a single thing from Knox College. I never have. And the only things I have are from social media. So, uh, you know, you two guys right there are on Facebook. So uh, that's how I got information about Knox the last two years, especially. I didn't know the previous coach, Tony Islas, very well, but he had been there 12 years as a part-timer. But I go to try to research this story, and I want to see exactly – no no, no offense to the, to the kids that were on that team and the kids that have been with the program or the alumni, but I was trying to honestly break down how bad th- things were in terms of the win-loss records because – Oftentimes, I'd see these Division three scores, and there'd be forfeits, there'd be shutouts, and both of you guys were dealing with that, and you've got a, the previous coach was also dealing with that. He was part-time. You guys were the first two full-time head coaches, and I want to go with Joe on this. Is There's nothing on the website anymore about wrestling. The only thing there is a link to the awards and honors, which goes back to like 2007. There's this year's roster, gone. This year's schedule, uh, gone. Uh, the 
information about the the news, the press releases that I did or didn't get, gone. The history of this program has basically been wiped off in less than a week from the website. So I find that troubling. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't really want to put a number on actually how bad the 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 win loss record was, but. Uh, you know th- th- that seems like a little bit of a of a of a slap in the face just to just to the guys that are on the, the that that are just finished up their school year that might even be staying as like, hey hey I can't even go look at look at the match results from this past year so uh, Joe when you got there what were you expecting uh, what were you happy with and, and what were some things that uh, obviously as a first year head coach your first head coaching position this was a good chance to get your get your feet wet but uh, you know it, it was was it a rather large undertaking. Yeah, I mean, I guess I knew when I took the job that it was going to be, you know, an uphill climb. But the way that I looked at it was, you know, this was an opportunity to to coach wrestling full time and get paid for it. Um, you know, and that was my goal long term, um, you know, and it was a school that I was somewhat familiar with, you know, being in Illinois and having, you know, they always came to the North Central Invite. Um, we had gone down to their their Chuck Porter duels that they had hosted. We'd gone to their, their Knox Invite, um, you know, and it was a similar school to North Central, you know, a small private liberal arts college. Um, and I knew, you know, I knew what the challenges were going to be with recruiting, you know, in terms of the school costs a lot of money. Um, you know, there are some admission standards, um, you know, and stuff like that. So I, I think I knew what I what I was getting myself into, um, you know, but I was happy with the interview process. It was awesome when I went there and I met with Chad Isley and he just seemed like someone that was, you know, he's an alum of Knox and, uh, you know, he, he's the athletic director now, but um, head coach there, you know, coach football and, and seemed like someone that was very supportive of Knox and, and everybody that I met as, as Matt mentioned was, was just a nice, genuine person. Um, you know, and they were excited about Knox and excited about Knox athletics. So, um, you know, I made the leap to move away from home and friends and family. And, you know, my girlfriend was back in Naperville and, um, you know, made the move out there and was happy ultimately that I did, um, because it ended up being an incredibly enjoyable experience for me. Um, you know, in terms of the guys that I coached, the parents, the alumni, um, you know, the, the support from the administration and, and everything. So, I would say overall, my experience there was great. Um, you know, it was, it, it was incredibly sad for me to leave. You know, I remember remember leaving, you know, the day that I did and, and, and just having a difficult time throwing everything in my truck and finally leaving because it was, a, you know, it was a special place to me and I enjoyed my time there. Now, Matt, in your case, you came in, you were a pre, you, this was your second head coaching gig. You were at the University of the Cumberlands. Uh, you wrestled uh, Division Three at, at Concordia. So you know the landscape of Division Three. Uh, of course, you're a Minnesota guy and, you know, we were, you know, we're, we're, we're I'm, 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 I'm married into Minnesota, as I say. So, uh, you know, spent time at Concordia, uh, you know, got, got to learn some, uh, some of those coaching tips from Steve Costanzo at St. Cloud. And, uh, you know, you were leaving one school in the NAI to division three and, you know, Joe was the first, first year, uh, full-time head coach. And you came in after that and, you know, was the table set up for you a lot better than you had known about the Knox program before? I mean, uh, I'm guessing Joe didn't leave the cupboard bare for you. No, not at all. And, and I knew the the situation. I mean, I had followed the program. I actually, you know, did a few of the Jay Robinson camps with uh, Tony Islas, the previous coach. So I, I kind of had a, you know, I, I guess I'd met him before. I wouldn't say that, you know, we were friends or anything, but we knew each other. And so I, I knew of the program and, and Joe by no means left the cupboard bare. Um, but I definitely knew what I was getting into at the same time. I mean, it was a program that never had, you know, a full coach before Joe. And, you know, they'd historically had problems with numbers. So, you know, I knew exactly what I was getting into and, I knew there was a long way to go with the program, but kind of like Joe said, you know, we went in there and really felt like, you know, they were excited about building it, you know, and and looking back, you know, it's one thing I've had a lot of time to think about this since I've heard, you know, one of my first conversations with the AD, you know, he talked about how, you know, they had thought several times about dropping the program. And so, you know, I think back to my first conversation and my last conversation, you know, that was brought up and that's, you know, it's still kind of a sore subject, you know, it kind of, it hurts the fact that, you know, more than once they thought about doing this, but, you know, yeah, things were definitely, you know, I felt like on the upswing there. And when I made my decision to leave, you know, I had to look at it, you know, like I said, from my health perspective, but I looked at it like, you know what, there's still two years of funding for this position before the school has to make a decision. Like they told me. So I thought it would be better off for me to get out where someone's got two full years to do it on their own and build this where now the program might take it over from the boosters you know, versus me, you know, trying to stay another year if something else happens. You know, I'm a head coach that, you know, can't do something halfway through the season. And now the team's really in trouble. Now they have less than one year of funding to bring somebody else in. So the fact that they made the decision they did after that, especially with, you know, my mindset and why I approach it that way was really disheartening. 
Now you you had touched on this, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll go with this now. And uh, let me let me just preface this by saying. Uh, I did reach out to Chad Isley, the athletic director. I asked him to come on the program um, before I actually talked to both of you guys on coming on, and he basically said he didn't want to. He, he, his communication on the the wrestling program was over; that he, he didn't want to talk about it, and that, that was it. And then I, I started researching some things about the the funding that you're alluding to, and I, I replied back to him. I said, "Hey, I just want to make sure my facts are, are straight, so I understand that the the this, the program was, was supposed to be funded at least head coaching position for the next three years." And he said that that was not accurate and he could not not he wasn't going to go into details about it because that was a private matter involving boosters so i got basically roadblocked there so uh from a journalistic standpoint i gave him the opportunity to come on the show to answer these questions and he uh he said no so we're getting it straight from the the two previous head coaches who had spent one year there so um joe let's go back to you and and when you talked about what 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 Matt had just said about the the, the five year pledge from the boosters, what was the the wrestling alumni? I mean, what was the plan there? At least the way you understood it for this full this full time position for the coaching staff, and then the the program to kind of take you know the athletics department to take the costs over. Yeah, well, I guess the way I understood it was you know that Tony Islas had done a great job there for for twelve years as a part time coach. And some things were changing in his his profession to where he couldn't do it anymore. Um, you know, and like Matt said, there were some talks about dropping the program, and they had some alumni step up and say, you know, we can we can fund this. You know, and and the the president at the time I think was trying to make some moves towards full time coaches across the board in sports. Um, you know, which is good. Uh, you know, in terms of each athletic program eventually having a full time head coach. Um, you know, and there were several, you know, boosters, one in particular, um, you know, Chuck Porter, who, who started the wrestling program when he was a freshman at Knox in 1948, um, you know, that, that has always been a huge supporter of the program that I think, you know, probably footed most of it. Um, you know, I knew that, that the money was coming from, you know, from boosters basically to pay my salary. Um, you know, and, and what he told me is, you know, if we can get this thing off the ground in, in the short amount of time that we have, you know, money from, from boosters to pay this, you know, then the school can, you know, hopefully step up and support it from that point out. Um, you know, but we have a short window here to, to, to grow the roster and, and, you know, make ourselves put ourselves on the map, I guess, to, to where we have, you know, a legitimate wrestling program, you know, so that was the goal right away. Um, you know, and I, obviously when I left, you know, I don't know, I, I can't say what happened with any of the booster dollars at that point. Um, you know, but, but I thought, you know, there was at least, you know, enough to bring Matt in and, and hopefully have another shot at getting it off the ground. Yeah, Matt, you had said you were kind of disappointed to hear that that that, that wasn't accurate. I mean, you know, it was what Joe said, I guess, probably, uh, you know, what echoed what, uh, what you had heard. And, you know, what, what do you think had changed? You know, I don't know what changed. That's really the... the That's what we're here to find out, follow. I guess, yeah. You know, because, like I said, I was told, you know, there was at least two more years of funding for it. And that would have been after my year. So, you know, that was what was really disappointing. The fact that, you know, they didn't even go out and try and look for another coach. You know, I remember one of our conversations, you know, where it was the fact that, well, we don't think we can get, you know, quality coaching here in time and, you know, really do this thing. So I think it's better to probably just end the program. And, you know, my thinking was, well, this is May, you know, why are we not even trying, you know, and if it's a money issue, I mean, maybe it's not a, you know, a real experienced coach. I mean, it can be, you know, there are a lot of options out there. So the fact that they went that way and, and the other thing that, you know, really bothers me about it and I probably didn't handle it the right way was I was asked to, you know, not really say anything because they wanted to approach the boosters themselves, you know, see them personally and let them know versus, you know, an announcement that I wouldn't be coming back. And, you know, I thought that was right at the time because, you know, let them speak with the boosters and, you know, do that, you know, personally like they wanted to. But, you know, looking back on it now, it feels like during that time when we didn't make an announcement that, you know, they really went out and met with the um, the regents and the president and made a decision to drop it and then went to see the boosters. And, and that was really disappointing. I, I feel like maybe, you know, if I would have contacted the boosters right away and maybe let them know my circumstances and and got some other people involved, maybe it could have, you know, been a little bit better. 
Yeah, and uh, I know Mike Moyer from the NWCA has put some calls in, and he's he's been trying to track down uh, the the Board of Governors or uh, uh, you know whatever whatever the title of that that group is at Knox. And the information on these guys has been pretty sparse. It's not like uh, you know the big D one schools they have all that stuff in their contact information at Knox. You're not finding any of that. And uh, you know I guess one thing I want to touch on before we we continue this line is as you both you guys talked about numbers and you know we've seen Milliken. At re, you know they restarted their wrestling program and they've got about you know they've already recruited 30 40 guys for the for the for the program uh Joe you're up at up at North Central you've you know you're at a division 3 school pretty much enrollment driven uh, Matt you were at, at at the NAI which is a lot of those schools were just started because they needed male enrollment so uh the situation is is where do you think the was it more than just the tuition and academics or was it the fact that the profile of the wrestling school wasn't really enticing to uh to wrestlers even within the state of Illinois and the, and the Quad Cities region. And, Joe, I know you were on the Illinois Mat Man. You, you, it seemed like you were kind of uh, disappointed that uh, some of the folks in Illinois, at least, weren't, weren't looking at schools like Knox uh, because they're Division three. Yeah, I mean, that's that's certainly frustrating, especially in a state like Illinois where, where high school wrestling is as strong as it is. Um, you know, I can't – I mean, I could tell you, you know, how many letters I sent out to, to – state qualifiers, kids that were ranked in the state, you know, kids that I knew were, were possible prospective college wrestlers and and over 200, you know, letters that I sent out and whether the coaches weren't giving them to the kids, you know, when they got to the high schools or whether the kids just weren't interested. Um, you know, I got less than 10% of those, you know, letters that I sent out are kids that actually went on, filled out our questionnaire and, and became a recruit. Um, you know, and then beyond that, sending out, you know, individual personalized emails to over a hundred coaches saying, Hey, you know, is so-and-so interested in wrestling? If you could pass along his contact information, I'd love to call him, um, you know, and not getting a whole lot of responses on that stuff too. So, you know, I think, you know, coaches need to step up and I I think parents need to step up and, and, you know, there's no shame in division three wrestling. And, uh, you know, if, if, if a kid can wrestle at the college level, he should wrestle at, you know, wrestle at the college level. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of kids go division one that shouldn't, or a lot of kids choose not to wrestle that should, um, you know, when they could be, you know, at a place like Knox where the numbers were low, they could, you know, they could be an impact kind of guy on the roster. Um, you know, so I think that's something that needs to move, you know, that needs to change. I have that problem, you know, now at North central and I've got 30 guys on my roster and, you know, we've been a, a top 25 program for a long time. And, and I call people that have never heard of North central. Um, you know, because we're not a division one wrestling program. And I think that needs to change. Matt, what were your experiences going through? Obviously you, you, you weren't from Illinois. Joe's from Illinois. So, I mean, he's, he's probably, he's got more contacts within the state, but you know, what was your, what was your strategy in trying to, to reach out? Because, uh, you know, a friend of mine uh, had sent me a tweet about this and said, you know, he'd been going to the Illinois state tournament for numbers of years and he's never met anybody from Knox. So, and this is a guy who's pretty well connected with, within the, uh, the Illinois wrestling community. So, you know, Matt, what were you trying to do to, to maybe erase that type of, of comment? Well, I'll tell you the same thing. I mean, to a point that Joe did, I mean, I recruited Illinois ridiculously hard, you know, and came in there and, you know, the first thing I did was look at all the other programs, uh, you know, in Augustana, North Central, University of Chicago, all these programs that have Division three wrestling programs and looked at their rosters and see where their kids are coming from. And I knew the strength of Illinois. I mean, it's a tremendous wrestling state. And the, seeing that, you know, most of these teams were bringing the majority of their kids from Illinois – you know, I thought that had to be, you know, ground one for me, even though I was kind of hearing from some of the administration that, you know, we might be better off looking at some of these other areas. You know, I thought Illinois had to be my, you know, top priority. And I reached out all over the place, every single, you know, qualifier um, in the state, as far as the years before, every high school, every senior that was ever ranked in the Illinois, you know, rankings, you know, we were reaching out to trying to get just as much information as possible and I really didn't, you know, get a lot of feedback. And the most feedback I got was actually in March. But, you know, we started this process back in early October. So I just really didn't get a lot of feedback from a lot of the people I was looking for, from the coaches and athletes in Illinois. You know, and I don't know if it was the fact that maybe had our sights set too high right away. You know, just because of the, the history of the program, you know, maybe should have been looking down a level. I don't know. But I know I just really didn't feel good about the responses I was getting. And and I know for a fact that, I mean, I spent two days, two of the three days at the uh, Illinois State Tournament, um, you know, made some pretty good contacts in the stands with just people that are up there. Obviously, you know, Division Three recruiting rules, you know, you can't be talking to the kids and seeing the kids on the day of competition, things like that. 
But, uh, you know, I was definitely there because of the kids I was talking with, you know, I want to make sure I was down there and seeing them wrestle so I could tell them, Hey, you know, I saw this match, saw that match, you know, look good, you know, and hopefully get a chance to, you know, see some of the different coaches. But, you know, like I said, it can't be visiting with parents and recruits on site of competitions. You know, there's also the part of numbers. You get kids in and then there's the retention. Um, you know, Joe, your first year, uh, usually with any coaching change, there's going to be some turnover. And I think with the Division Three landscape, it is you'll have kids that come out for a year or two and be like, you know what, uh, you know, it's just not for me. You know, it, it happens. I mean, that's the one thing about, about Division Three that's actually a, a positive in the, on that same same basic mindset is – these guys are out there because they want to be. There's not scholarships situations athletically. So, you know, you get a kid that's on your team for, you know, a year or two and realize it's not for him. It's, it's really no harm, no foul. But when you look at when you don't have enough guys to fill a Ross, a fill a lineup, uh, you may, I think you were saying you had seven guys at, at one point and uh, you know, how, what, what was the trouble with retention? I guess we'll start with Joe. Um, you know, I knew right away when I got there, and I got some great advice from uh, from Jim Grunwald over at Wheaton. You know, at the second tournament of the year, we were at the MSOE invite um, up in Milwaukee, and, and Jim said, you know, you can't beat your, your beat your head against the wall. Um, you know, it's going to take you three, four years before you've got your guys in there, and right now what you have is what you have. Um, you got to make sure those kids are having fun. You got to make sure they're enjoying coming to the wrestling room every day, um, you know, and, and you got to be patient with it. Um, you know, so we did that and we, you know, we played dodgeball a lot in practice. We played a lot of games and we had a lot of fun and, um, you know, I was lucky enough to keep, you know, everybody on the team that, that, that I had, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, you might lose a, cl- a close match cause you're not in as good a shape as you want to be, um, you know, cause maybe practices aren't as tough as you want them to be, but I knew, you know, in, in the situation that I was in, um, you know, retention was important and I had to keep guys out cause, you know, I was working with kids that, that a lot of them, you know, wrestling was, you know, fourth or fifth on their list of priority th- things that they want to do. Um, you know, so just to keep them coming in into the wrestling room every day was important. Um, you know, and I know obviously undergoing a coaching change is, is tough and, and, you know, Matt lost a lot of those and I, you know, maybe he amped it up a little bit and was a little bit tougher on those guys or, or they just weren't have as much fun. So, you know, I know he struggled a little bit with retention, but, um, you know, it's hard when you're dealing with kids that are, you know, that aren't going to college to wrestle. Yeah, Matt, what was your situation? Obviously, Joe had brought in a, a fresh crop the year before. And I mean, I'm, when we say fresh crop at Knox, it's maybe maybe a handful of kids. But, uh, you know, we're, what were your issues with retention? Well, um, you know, we had seven kids, like I said, from our first competition to our last. Our problem was is somewhere in the middle, the kids decided that they didn't want to wrestle. So between when I was hired on September 22nd and, you know, when Joe left, there were a number of kids that just decided they weren't going to wrestle anymore. And, you know, I remember Joe and Chad were, you know, telling me about all these kids and, you know, it was pretty exciting thinking, all right, you know, we're going to have enough kids to field a team here. But then once we got started, you know, most of these, well, it was before we got started that majority of these kids said that they weren't going to wrestle. And then we had two kids in the first two days of practice, you know, and then, like I said, this is the first two days of practice. You know, it's not like we're doing a whole lot the first couple of days, just getting into some of the bare essentials. And they said they didn't want to wrestle. So, you know, we had seven guys more or less from start to finish. So, you know, we kept the guys that started with us. But, you know, our problem was the kids that just they didn't want to come out, you know, from previous years. And, you know, I, I think it was just kind of something easy. You know, I think they had a relationship with Joe. And when, you know, unfortunately, when he left, it's like, well, it's easier to step out now you know, instead of having to break a promise to someone else or get to know somebody and then feel obligated. I mean, like Joe said, for some of these kids, it's probably their fourth, fifth priority. And, and it was just kind of the easy way to get out, you know, kind of between coaches. So, um, you know, I felt good about the kids that we kept out. Like Joe said, you know, some of these guys, it wasn't their priority. And I knew that, and, you know, we had to really back it down compared to, you know, maybe practices we'd run, you know, elsewhere. But, you know, those guys really stepped it up. And by the end of the year, you know, we were doing practices just like anywhere else I'd done. And those guys were, you know, they were still in there, they were fighting, they were working hard and they were all excited to come back next year. So uh, I really feel for those guys right now, you know, what their situation is. Yeah, And also you, you've probably got to, you know, both of you guys going through the college wrestling ranks know that, you know, there's you've seen you friends that have been at, at, at programs that where there's a coaching revolving door. I mean, some of these kids have probably dealing with three coaches in three years. and They might have just said, oh, screw this. I'm done. Yeah, absolutely. 
Now, as we look at what what Knox could have done, okay, because you know after the fact, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of I was I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of every, every time there's a drop program, I, I get I get kind of flustered. Obviously, uh, we, we've heard about what happened with Yeshiva, and there's a lot more there than just uh, just being a, a Jewish college that doesn't wrestle on on Saturday. But they had all sorts of money issues. So I mean, Yeshiva, you can kind of look at me like, well, it sucks, but you know, you can kind of understand this one, you know, as as troubled as the lineup was with with the forfeits and whatnot this is illinois this is a, a you know division three wrestling where numbers i mean some of these division three schools that aren't very good in terms of win losses and dual meets still have a lot of numbers i mean they've got kids that come to the school for wrestling so you know again i, I was annoyed the fact that i i couldn't get uh the, the ad to really come on the show and talk about this uh, i guess maybe he heard the cleveland state interview and said uh, no but w- when we talk about what could Knox have done uh, or what wasn't done that you thought was going to be done? Uh, and then that made, uh, made, it, made this maybe be a, a little bit more sour. I mean, Matt, you had kind of touched on it about, you know, wishing you'd have done things a little differently with, with uh, when you leaving, but you know, I, I don't want to say were there any broken promises along the line. I mean, it seems like that, that five-year pledge seems to be one of those, but uh, Matt, what was the, probably the most frustrating thing that you had to deal with, uh, you know, with, within the department? Well, I mean, within the department, I mean, from start to finish, like I said, I, I thought there was plenty of support as far as uh, an athletic department that, you know, was fairly young in the sense that, you know, there was never a lot of support before with full-time coaches, things like that. The, the program, you know, in the department has grown quite a bit in recent years. So, you know, that was a good thing, but there was definitely, you know, issues, you know, along the entire athletic department with numbers I mean, recruiting athletically to Knox has just kind of always been a, a struggle, I guess, you know, with the football team, the 60, 70 some guys on it, you know, so that's, I think that's a little bit indicative of, you know, some of the struggles that we had recruiting at Knox and, and it was hard to put your finger on it, you know, why recruiting was such an issue there. Um, but it was, and it's some of those things that obviously I learned a lot and wish I could have taken some of them into year two, but, you know, I don't think, you know, throughout the course of the year, there were broken promises, things like that. I felt like I had great support. And at the end, I'm still, I'm just, I'm baffled why, you know, they didn't decide to go forward and look for another coach. You know, I know there's financial struggles there. The school's definitely, you know, hurting for money right now. There's, I don't know what, how many million dollar deficit they were facing this year. Um, it just seems like it was the easy way out. Like, you know, we'll save some money here and we don't have to even think about paying a salary the next couple of years and we can divert it somewhere else and hopefully grow the department that way. Yeah, and again, the thing here that seems to be floating around is that the you had kind of said that the you know the the board made the decision, and then went to the boosters. Uh, this kind of looks a little bit maybe like uh, like almost maybe not exactly the same, but kind of a, a Notre Dame type of situation where you know they had a, a benefactor for the program, and that money was re- reallocated to the general athletic fund. And uh, I, I don't have anything to confirm that. It's just that's more of a hunch than anything. So uh, you know. You know, well, is that a common thought right now that it says, all right, well, they've, they've talked the boosters out of funding wrestling. I'll tell you this also, and this was something that, you know, I give, you know, Chad Isley a lot of credit. I mean, I really enjoyed working for him. He was, you know, a great athletic director, in my opinion, but he told me I, it must've been my first month on the job. There was a board of regents meeting and uh, he came to me and, you know, just kind of jokingly, he's like, yeah, so we had our meeting today. And one of the regents came up to me and said, so we're dropping wrestling, right? And he said, he, you know, he laughed it off and said, what? No, we're not dropping wrestling. Man, we just hired a new coach and things are looking good. You know, we're, we're moving forward. And he came in, you know, like I said, just kind of telling me that in jest, but it was like, wow. I mean, that's, you know, this guy was that far out of the loop. He didn't even know we hired someone new. He walks into a meeting. This is the first thing, you know, one of the regions said to him. So, you know, again, looking back, you know, from our first phone conversation about me looking at the job, you know, when they brought up drop and wrestling to that conversation with the regents there, you know, it, it kind of does make me wonder whether there were people in the administration, not Chad Isley, not the president, I don't believe, but if there weren't, you know, members of the regents or whatever, they were looking for a way to save some money and maybe reallocate it somewhere else. Joe, as we look at, uh, you know, obviously you're a North Central guy. I mean, that's where you wrestled. That's, that's where you coach now. But when, you look at the growth of Division Three. You're seeing Division Three schools pop up. I mean, Matt, you've seen this in the NAI really a whole lot. But uh, you're seeing more programs adding it at the uh, the non D1 levels. 
and especially at Division Three, the championships are so much fun. It's one of the best tournaments I enjoy covering. I make a point to get out there uh, every year, at least since 2009, uh, any way that I can in whatever capacity I can. So, you know, speaking from a Division Three coaching standpoint, there's, you know, and you, you kind of touched on this with uh, kind of the, the frustration maybe with Division Three. Division Three, to me, is the, the championships are one of the five best wrestling events that I attend. And I'm not counting the Olympics in this because that's every four years. But it's, uh, you know, when I say favorite events, I mean, they're fun to cover. They're exciting to watch. So in that in that distinction, I put the Division One championships. I put the Junior Nationals in Fargo, although I have a couple different reasons why I like Fargo. You have the Virginia Duels, my home wrestling club. Then you have the World Championships. And then the Division Three championships. And I've covered the NAIs, the ones, the twos, the threes, the junior colleges. I've been to pretty much every major wrestling event in this country. And I'll say this as, as a wrestling fan, Division Three wrestling is so much fun because, again, no scholarships. A lot of these guys are – you might have some weekend warriors that are 30 years old getting back on the mat. You might have a guy that's taken three or four years off from the last time he wrestled. He comes back and, and, and becomes an All-American. So uh, the fact that we're, we're losing Division Three programs, it's two in the last month, where we've been adding Division Three programs for the last 10 years – uh, you know, Joe, I guess I kind of want your, your, your soapbox statement about why Division Three is great, uh, not why you, should be, you shouldn't be wrestling D1, but why Division Three wrestling should be looked at as a, as a great opportunity to compete in the sport that, uh, that people grew up wrestling with. Well, Division Three is great because it gives you, it gives you an opportunity to go to, to a great school. I mean, Knox is a great school. North Central is a great school. Um, and get, in a, get a good education, you know, whatever – whatever education you want to get, you're talking, you know, at North Central, we've got majors all across the board. We've got pre-med guys on my team. I've got journalism majors. I've got education majors. I've got athletic training majors. Um, and still be able to participate in your sport while you're in a class of 20 to 25 guys. Um, you know, obviously you're excluding the the UW schools from stuff like this, but, you know, most Division three schools are, are very similar to a place like North Central and like Knox where, you know, your, your enrollment is anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000. Um, you know, you're in smaller class sizes and you're going to benefit from the sort of leadership that you're going to gain from, from, you know, personal attention in the classroom and small class sizes, but you're still getting an opportunity to be a leader in the wrestling room as well. Um, where, you know, if you weren't a state champ, even if you weren't a state place winner, I mean, we've had all Americans here at North central that, that never placed at the state tournament. Um, you know, so it gives those guys an opportunity to, to continue to pursue, you know, some, some athletic dreams and, and whatever goals they have on that side of it while, you know, going on and, and, getting the education that they need to get because they're not going to go, you know, wrestle in the world championships. They're not going to go wrestle, you know, for an Olympic medal. Yeah. And then I guess the one question I have about all of this, and I guess I'll pitch this uh, to Matt now as, as we finish up here on the show is I, I just sit here and I wonder, well, what, what could we have done as, as a sport, as a college, as a coach, as a community, what can be done? I mean, I mean, see, Joe, you got a program, uh, that's your alma mater that you got to worry about up at North Central, but obviously having that tie to Knox and then you know Matt just leaving. What 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 do you think could have been done here? Uh, like I said, we'll start with Matt. And what do you think still can be done to maybe save this program? I know the NWCA is involved. Mike Moore has been making calls, but uh, you know Matt, your thoughts on uh, where do we go from here? Well, I think I would say two things. You know, one, you know, we had some tremendous boosters that really helped us out a lot at Knox and in the funding for various things. But it was a very select few, you know, whether, you know, you were a starter, an All-American, whatever the case, you know, I think alumni need to be engaged. And I think our top alumni base were engaged in Knox, but the rest, you know, not as much. And, you know, any little bit helps with these college programs, you know, so I think the alumni base needs to be very involved. And, you know, that unfortunately does mean financially as well, you know, even if it's $25 a year, but I think that shows the administration that it's relevant, that it's, it's important to people. And then I, I think the, the high school coaches, you know, they need to make sure that, you know, of course, you have your alma mater, Joe has his, I have mine, and we love our alma maters. But, you know, high school coaches need to look big picture for their athletes. You know, not that, well, I don't know if he's college material. You know, I would hope that they would want to put any athlete on their team on a college wrestling program. And I know when I was contacting high school coaches, you know, I would want everybody and I'd say, hey, you know, these were some of our standards are these are kind of the kids we're looking at, you know, but we want anyone, any seniors on your team that you think are interested in college wrestling, you know, 
And they need to get that information out to the kids, not because, well, I don't think it's a good fit for them. You know, the kids need to make that choice with their parents and whoever else is in the decision making process. But we need to get all these options out there for the kids to have them in front of, you know, let us coaches get in front of them, let us talk to them, you know, so they can make those decisions and help build those rosters so we don't have these issues at other schools. Yeah, and I also want to make this point. Uh, it's not really a point. It's more of a comment because in the research, uh, I did notice that the only thing really on the website that's left are the wrestling awards and honors, and it goes back to 2007. And I'm looking at some of this stuff, and I'm like, oh, Prairie Fire Performer of the Week, Performer of the Week, Performer of the Week. The only All-American in school history at the Division Three level was a heavyweight in 2007 named Jaron Rutledge, and uh, he's an Illinois kid. Uh, well, he's probably not. A, he's obviously not a kid anymore. That was like eight years ago, but that that snapped a 27 year drought of even competing at the division three championships. So, you know, even, and that's how, I guess how important one single wrestler can be to, to a college program. I mean, we've seen it with some of these smaller division three schools that, you know, wow, this is this guy's, this school's first all American in, you know, 15 years. And it, and the school gets excited about it and it only takes really one kid to change that. So uh, I, I kind of maybe say, you know, some of those kids may not have even been looking at Knox, but, uh, I just wanted to give uh, at least Jaron Rutledge, the only All American in school history, uh, a little bit of a little bit of due there because he took third back in two thousand and seven. So uh, as, as we wrap up here, Joe, I'm going to give you the final word here. Obviously, since you were the first full time coach the school had, and you and your your current head coach, obviously Matt, you're, you're stepping away from coaching because of uh, the health issues. But uh, but Joe, what do you think could have been done different uh, when you were there after the fact? What do you think? Uh, you know, you can do. What do you think the people in the state of Illinois can do to maybe? Uh, talk people uh, out, of, out, of, out of this bad decision? Yeah, well, I think in terms of, you know, when I was there, things that could have been done differently, I, you know, there's nothing I can really think of. You know, from from day one, you know, Chad said, what do you need? You know, and it, he said, I think we might need a new wrestling mat. I said, yeah, you're probably right. We bought a brand new wrestling mat. I said, I think we need new singlets. We bought new singlets. You know, he got me what I told him I needed for, for a stipend for a part-time assistant coach. Um, you know, and I had all the support that I ever, you know, felt I ever needed to, to to build a program there. Um, you know, so in terms of things that I needed that I wasn't getting, um, you know, there's not really anything that you could look at the college, you know, for, um, obviously we already talked about, you know, we need high school coaches in Illinois to, to respond to our emails. You know, we need them to, to, to push their kids to wrestle division three. Um, you know, we need, the, you know, the parents that think Johnny's a division one wrestler to realize that there's no shame in sending Johnny to Knox college to wrestle division three. Um, you know, and I think, you know, if, if, if there's one thing that Knox really needs, they need a coach that's going to commit to this. Um, you know, if, if they're willing to do this, they need a coach that's going to, you know, embrace the program and nurture that program and, and, and bring it up, you know, from wherever it is now, six or seven guys on the team, um, you know, and commit to being there. And I think, you know, I certainly did that. You know, had I not had the opportunity that I did, you know, I'd still be at Knox and I'd probably be at Knox for a long time. And I think, you know, Matt, Matt would probably say the same thing if it weren't for his health issues. Um, you know, so neither of us are leaving because we didn't feel, you know, supported by the alumni or, or by the athletic director or even the college president. Um, you know, Knox is a great place and, and there's no reason why, you know, they shouldn't be able to have a competitive wrestling program there. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is brought to you by Flips Wrestling. Share your attitude and be heard at flipswrestling.com. Like what you hear on Short Time? Drop us a rating and a review on iTunes by going to matttalkonline.com slash getshorttime.